Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much to all of you for coming out this evening. A, a small but dedicated audience. We few, we happy few to be here to hear the Dibner Lecture in the History of Science and Technology. I'm delighted to say that this is the third in a series of programs that the Huntington has hosted in relation with its remarkable loan from the National Gallery in London of Joseph Wright of Derby's masterpiece, An Experiment on a Bird with an Air Pump. And some of you will have heard me say before that the National Gallery itself is welcome to keep the reciprocal loan, Gainsborough's Blue Boy, in perpetuity, and will keep the Joseph Wright of Derby forever as part of the exchange. About a month ago, David Salkin from the Courtauld Institute came uh, to this room to talk about um, Wright's painting from the art historical perspective. And we thought it would be a really nice idea to have a more scientific and experimental perspective on the picture. Um, for that reason, we invited Professor Tita Chico from the University of Maryland to be this year's Dibner lecturer. So it's my pleasure to welcome her and to introduce her this evening. She is a professor in the Department of English and faculty director of the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies at the University of Maryland at College Park, Go Terps. Um, she holds a BA in English from Vassar College, her MA and PhD from NYU. She's held fellowships from the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Mellon Foundation, the Harry Ransom Center at UT Austin, the School for Advanced Study at the University of London, Chawton House Library, and New College in the University of Oxford. She's the author of two monographs, Designing Women, The Dressing Room in 18th Century English Literature and Culture, which appeared in 2005. And more importantly, in the context of this evening, the experimental imagination, literary knowledge and science in the British Enlightenment, which appeared in 2018 and was hugely well reviewed in the TLS on its publication. With Tony Bowers, she's also edited Atlantic Worlds in the Long 18th Century, Seduction and Sentiment, which appeared in 2012. Tita's ongoing interests in the intersections of literary and scientific cultures in 18th century England mean that she's uniquely well qualified to, dismiss, uh, to discuss the context in which Wright was painting. Not least because she's currently working on a book entitled Wonder, Literature and Science in the Long 18th Century. So to discuss Wonder and Wonders, 18th century science and the imagination, please welcome the Dibner lecturer, Professor Tita Chico. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to see you all and to be here together tonight. Um, I am honored to say and delighted this is my first in-person event since March 2020. I was speaking at the University of Buffalo, came home and everything shut down. Um, and so it's been a long time to be amongst my friends and colleagues, a very long time indeed. I want to express a special thank you to everyone who made this evening possible, and just to name a few people, including Juan Gomez, Catherine Wiley Miller, Natalie Serrano, and to Steve Hindle, who just spoke, and to whom I'm very grateful for this generous invitation. I work, as Steve mentioned, at the University of Maryland, an institution that sits on the ancestral homelands of the Piscataway people, who are among the first in the Western Hemisphere. The University of Maryland, go Terps, as Steve knows Maryland, uh, is dotted with buildings that name but forget this indigenous history. Susquehanna Hall, the home of the English department for 20 years, comes from the Lenape for Oyster River. Pocomoke Hall, the Algonquin for Blackwater, names the Pocomoke people. And Arundel Hall, Calvert Hall, St. Mary's Hall, these all allude to the first three counties founded by English colonists in the 17th century. And then there is the dorm, Queen Anne's Hall, named for the 18th century British monarch, an era that I study and an era in which large scale settler colonialism and geno genocide devastated the tribal nations in what we now think of as modern day Maryland. The university has recently taken very modest measures to recognize its indigenous history developing, as many institutions have, a land acknowledgement. And they also named a new dining hall in the Algonquin word for meaning a place to meet, eat. 
I was struck by a student uh, op-ed in the newspaper which said that absent substantive actions, these modest measures, are performative and lacking. I begin my comments today to think about the long 18th century, the 18th century that shapes the place where I research, where I teach, and the long 18th century, as my colleague Eugenia Zorowski says, isn't over for the people connected to this land. And it is to this long 18th century that isn't over that I'd like us to now turn. We gather here today on the occasion of Joseph Wright's magnificent an experiment on a bird in the air pump. And I knew it was large, but it wasn't until I got to see it this morning with Steve that it really struck me that six feet by eight feet hanging on the wall on loan from the National Gallery is an illuminating experience. Thanks to the Huntington, we have the occasion which I hope you partake, to view, admire, and contemplate Wright's writing and its painting, excuse me, and its myriad contexts. To gaze for a moment upon Wright's painting, we, sorry, there we go. Um, to gaze for a moment upon Wright's painting, we see a group clustered around a central illumination. What we have is a tower of candlelight it's a scientist, a bird, and a glass that glass dome that rise majestically in the composition center. The responses from those present in the painting vary from excitement to wary curiosity to distress, that poor little girl, to distraction. If these figures are gathered around in a pose of a conversation piece, there seems in some ways to be little interaction amongst the group as a whole what we see instead are individuals and clusters of implied relations. We have the father comforting his daughters. We have young lovers looking at each other. We have an attendant and a servant, a learned witness. All of them are curled in various ways into the glow of this scientific demonstration. At its center, the master of ceremonies is a natural philosopher, a scientist, most likely a traveling scientist selling the performance of scientific experiments to middling classes in London and throughout England during the 18th century. To suffocate a bird in an air pump, and that's at the center of this drama, but to suffocate a bird in an air pump confirms well-known and well-documented theories about gas and vacuums developed the previous century by, among others, Robert Boyle, the Anglo-Irish natural philosopher and one of the founders of England's Royal Society. To suffocate a burb in an air pump also, of course, confirms the centrality of air to life. The demonstration of this instrument and revelations in the mid-18th century domestic milieu does not reveal a new scientific truth but Wright's painting as an artful rendering of the sociability of scientific demonstration does. The painting, the air pump, in other words, is itself what I would call a wonder. That is, something that causes astonishment, for it draws upon the web of associations about natural phenomena that continued to circulate throughout the 18th century. Associations that linked portents and facts and that revealed interconnections among people, institutions, and ideas. Part one, wonder and wonders. The 18th century was a world populated by fantastical wonders. A little boy had Latin and Hebrew etched in the whites of his eyes. A woman infected with smallpox found that her legs self-amputated. A tree moaned and ambled about the countryside, and the moon, it bled. It was also a world where the vice president of the Royal Society encountered what he called very aged persons in the north of England, of course, the north of England, who lived up to 140 years, or where one sketched, as John Hamilton Mortimer did, a scaly and hairy, human-like enraged monster choking an oceanic creature. And this, I'd love to point out, is in the Huntington's collection. The 18th century archive, in other words, is filled with the unexplained and the mysterious, the strange, open to interpretation by all. 
These beg the question, what is wonder? Wonder, of course, is a noun and it's a verb. A wonder is an object external to the self that include, induces the feeling of wonder. To wonder is to feel differently, to be astonished, as an experience of something unexpected, something unknown, however that might be understood. Eighteenth-century acting manuals give insight into what wonder might look like embodied for the stage, for an audience. The essayist Aaron Hill defines wonder as an inquisitive fear. It is an ebb of spirits rushing back upon the heart, but leaving an alarm upon the muscles that invigorates them toward defense and opposition. John Drummond, the author of The Art of Reading and Speaking in Public, enjoins actors to appear wide-eyed, either staring upwards at the sky or more often fixed on the object with the look of wildness and fear. As a concept, wonder mobilizes expectation, if only to thwart it. For some, to wonder is to feel disoriented and to be taken away from oneself. For others, to wonder is a way of knowing the world. Wonder, as a feeling, has always, in the Western tradition, been inextricable from knowing. Plato and Aristotle identify wonder as the original condition for philosophy, a discipline devoted to thinking and to thinking about knowledge, what we know and how we know it. In Plato's great work on the nature of knowledge, he explains that the sense of wonder is the mark of the philosopher. Philosophy indeed has no other origin. Aristotle opines in metaphysics, it is owning to their wonder that men both now begin and at first began to philosophize. Thomas Hobbes in the Leviathan later explained that wonder excites the appetite of knowing the cause. For René Descartes, wonder trains the mind, for it induces close observation. The soul is suddenly taken by surprise, which causes it to consider attentively the objects it finds rare and extraordinary. Wonder ensures that one learns, and wonder ensures that one remembers. We can say of wonderment, Descartes writes, that its particular utility is to enable us to learn and retain in our memory things of which we were formerly unaware. Cartesian wonder is pedagogical. It facilitates one's learning and it facilitates one's memory of that learning. Descartes' understanding reveals that wonder, for him it's the first passion, it's the original passion and it has no opposite. It reveals that wonder is not merely a feeling of astonishment and surprise at something new, but also a distinctly epistemological feeling. The passion of wonder for Descartes is an intellectual mode, a form of knowing. Wonder institutes and demands attention and scrutiny. Wonder may be first experienced as surprise or astonishment, but its effect is both to produce and retain knowledge of new things. By the late 17th century in Britain, Natural philosophers embrace the intellectual promise of wonder, under understanding it as a catalyst for productive curiosity. The ubiquity of the phrase observe with wonder in natural philosophical texts signals a twinned operation of wonder and witnessing. The Dutch naturalist Antoine, um, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was a minor Dutch official in the town of Delft for 50 years beginning in 1673, wrote long detailed letters to the Royal Society describing observations through his homemade single lens microscope. And this is a wonderful replica that's at the welcome. He was elected to a fellow as fellow of the Royal Society in 1680. In a letter published in 1709 in Philosophical Transactions, dedicated to microscopical observations of the tongue, the translation uses the term wonder to gesture to the imaginative work of microscopy. 
when the natural philosopher observes an unconceivable number of painted particles, and that word unconceivable is really key here, that I imagine are endued with a power to produce the sensation of taste, calculation fails. You can't count them, they're too many. As a consequence, the term wonder, wonder comes into play and it, it modifies modes of observation. Therefore, with great wonder, always discovered a mighty number of very slong, slender long particles. I cut several scaly particles, which having placed before the microscope, I observed with wonder a great number of holes or cavities. Writers and thinkers throughout the 18th century encouraged readers to practice natural philosophy specifically so they might experience wonder. In 1721, Joseph Brown's translation of Daniel Le Leclerc's A Natural and Medicinal History of Worms, bred in the bodies of men and other animals, which is really fun to read, in fact, um, uh, Brown enjoys his, enjoins his dedicatee, John the Duke of Montague, to embrace the wonder such study promises. Raptures of delight must fill your grace's soul, writes Brown. Surprise and wonder makes you gaze. He's talking about worms, remember? Okay, so Brown's language vividly registers a common interweaving of experimentation and marvel, study and feeling, cultivating the experience of wonder as a defining condition of early science. If wonder serves at the, as the provocation for early scientific study, as these examples suggest, then it likewise concludes with the terminus of natural philosophical knowledge production. We begin with wonder and we end with science. Robert Boyle makes clear that while we experience wonder when we admire corporeal things, how noble and soever precious they may be as stars and gems. I love, he picks very sparkly objects to characterize his examples. Such wonder dissipates as we come to know such things more intimately. These objects having but a bounded nature and commonly but some one thing fit to be wondered at, our admiration of them is seldom lasting, but after a little familiarity with them, first languishes and then ceases. For Boyle, the duration of wonder prompted by the natural world is always limited. It begins and it ends. To wonder in these moments is to begin an intellectual process that dissolves the experience of wonder into categorizable knowledge. Our wonder, explains Boyle, is allayed by a kind of secret reproach grounded on that very wonder. In other words, Encountering and studying the natural world may well produce the experience of wonder, but this likewise plants the seeds for its deflation and demise. Other scholars have postulated that the intellectual capital of wonder falls by the mid 18th century, arguing that by that point, wonder is no longer associated with intellectual study or intelligent study, but instead, marks someone's foolishness, someone's vulgarity. From this view, rather than a justification for scientific endeavor, wonder, these, these scholars argue, was an effective response of an inter, ignorant individual. To be swept away by wonder was to be a dupe, and wonder was usually a hoax. But I see a different trajectory for wonder one in which it continues to shape our understandings of the natural world, even while it comes to be associated at the same time with hoaxes, ignorance, and naivete. And Adam Smith, now remembered, of course, for his writings on capitalism and the wealth of nations and moral philosophy in the theory of moral sentiments, contributes an important mid-18th century discussion in the history of astronomy that identifies the persistence of wonder not only as central to natural philosophy, but as its continued point of origin. In this brief but very significant treatise, Smith names the sort of things that provoke wonder. 
He writes, we wonder at all extraordinary and uncommon objects, at all the rarer phenomena of nature, at meteors, comets, eclipses, at singular plants and animals, and at everything, in short, with which we have before been either little or not at all acquainted. And we still wonder, though forewarned of what we are to see. Those rarer phenomena of nature that he names are all associated with the scientific disciplines of astronomy, biology, botany, in short, natural philosophy. They likewise share the property of being, in Smith's language, new. And the exemplary individual who experiences wonder, it's a natural philosopher. It's the scientist who examines a singular plant or singular fossil. Smith's examples locate wonder not only as a feeling and not only as an object encountered in the natural world, but also and still by 1748 as integral to how we study the natural world. Part two, portents and facts. I began a little bit earlier by evoking a catalog of wonders, 140 year old humans, a boy's eyes that have writing in them, a woman whose legs fall off, a tree that walks around and moans, and a bleeding moon. These examples come from what we would consider today as distinct genres. On the one hand, scientific treatises and demonstrations, and then on the other, popular pamphlets and broadsides. Our contemporary ideas about fact and fiction, that they are in no way related to one another and they're, they're completely separate, is a historical invention and it is also an idea that obscures their interrelation and mutually constitutive nature. This is not to say that there are not real things, and this is not to say that there are false things. It is instead to say that wonder helps us recognize how close observation of the natural world can re reveal a fact just as easily as it can reveal a portent. Studying wonder helps us to see the role of imaginative thinking in our understandings of the natural world around us. That is, what constitutes our world, and just as importantly, whose version of that world matters. So let's talk about these very aged persons in the north of England. Martin Lister, was the vice president of the Royal Society, he was a court physician, and he's best known as England's first arachnologist and conchologist. He is convinced enough that these individuals are anywhere from 108 to 140 years old to suggest that they be studied further. He has a sort of dramatis persona, it's almost like reading a, a play. Um, of listing men and women, fathers and son, sons. One Robert M Montgomery seems to be 126. A Mary Allison seemed to have died at 108. And then he meets a son and a father who tell him, and he, see, he believes, are 100 and 140. But are these instances believable? Lister cautions in his essay that I find it very hard and troublesome to verify precisely the ages of such persons. But he's not unconvinced. And he speculates and is wonderful that even their diet, maybe it's their diet, um, is the root cause. And he goes through the chemistry of that. As he's doing this, he lends his own credibility as a scientific authority to their claims boldly stating, I am confident that many scores of persons might be found the age of 100 or older among these northern mountains. His account does several things at once. It lists, it disavows, and it affirms. But in total, it evokes wonder as the reason to start natural philosophy. Martin published this wonder in the first scientific journal in England, the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions, first edited in 1665. 
And today's scientific journals are not an accurate analog. Imagine instead a readership of landowners and aristocrats, merchants and natural philosophers, professional and middling ranks, men and women. The popularity of philosophical transactions prompted reissues, including a three-volume miscellany in 1707 and an abridgment called The Memoirs of the Royal Society in 1739. These all together remind us of the profitable and for-profit scientific book trade that generated income for the Royal Society. The genre of the scientific periodical arguably differs from the genre of the broadside and the occasional pamphlet. Yet, and this is what I'm interested in, they both traffic in captivating stories. The other wonders I've mentioned come from these other genres, popular ephemeral texts printed on cheaper paper, which we'll see in a second, and handed around. And this one, you can see in the replication of it how inexpensive the paper is. It's bleeding through. Um, does, it hasn't aged well. But in, in this broadside entitled The Wonder of Nature, Europe's Miracle from 1701, we learn about this seven-year-old Dutch boy, Henrik T. Kent, who has decipherable text printed in the whites of his eyes. In the right, in Latin, in capitals, meus deus, and in the left eye, the same words in Hebrew. In the, broad, in the broad side, the causes for this phenomenon remain unexplained, but the veracity of its existence is confirmed by a phalanx of several eminent divines, doctors, and other learned men. Moreover, as the author of the pamphlet emphasizes, the little boy's eyes are available for public view. In other words, Anyone reading this broadside can buy access to the experience of wonder, just as one might purchase admission to a scientific demonstration or a lecture in a shop. The readers are encouraged to stop by Mr. Powell's Coffee House near the Royal Exchange in Cornhill, where the parents are ready to confirm every particular therein. And we also learn he's been taken all around Europe and even um, to some courts. Henrik is now daily seen by persons of the highest rank and quality who express wonderful admiration and satisfaction, the like having not been known in the memory of man. I mean, I am reminded, is this, is this a coffee house? Is it Coney Island, right? Henrik T. Kent's eyes may have a divine inscription, but they are also a commodity on the commercial market for wonders. So Henrik's eyes are confirmed as wonders by the narrator who speaks on his behalf and by all of these various external authorities who profit from them. But another pamphlet uses the voice of the first person to document a woman's experience of wonder at her own body. In this, the Devonshire woman from 1723 one Francis Flood recounts getting sick with smallpox and losing her legs. She is poor, and upon fall falling ill, she's refused charity by the parish. After finally finding refuge and some comfort by crawling into an empty barn, her legs self-amputate, or in her words, my flesh was separated. Her left leg goes first. It broke off as though it were a rotten stick. Then, after Flood is visited by a surgeon, a, her right leg takes action on its own. On the 24th, about six in the morning, when I arose and opened the cloths, I found my leg fallen from me. Painless and yet quick healing, Flood's self-amputation presents a body that acts on its own accord beyond the purview of charity and beyond the purview of surgical expertise. Buried in their own plot on the Saltford churchyard, Flood's, Flood's legs dropped off from my body in the middle of the bone. I had no surgeon for my help. 
she's not a good poet, but you get the point. Abandoned by the network of parish care and impervious to the care of surgical remedies, the wonder of Francis Flood's self-amputating legs circulates as a curiosity that refuses to yield scientific explanation. It also circulates as a very sharp social critique of the elite who ignore the hardships endured by the poor. And confirmation of this wonder comes from her first-person account and through the churchyard epitaph, drawing simultaneously upon nascent notions of the individual as a source of truth and the traditional authority associated with Christian burial practices. So the aged persons of the North, the boy with the text in his eyes, the self-amputating legs, these wonders stand as credible according to various explanatory regimes, blending scientific authority and social standing, and drawing upon the logic of wonder as either a starting point for scientific inquiry or a conclusion that shows its limits. I want to turn now to the case of the groaning tree observed near Limington in Hampshire, because it shows us how wonder may be understood as simultaneously scientific and miraculous, both as an explainable fact and an otherworldly portent. As recounted by one PQ, who identifies as a doctor and a fellow of the Royal Society, this tree pulls up its roots and nearby shrubbery and ambles through the countryside for two days until it comes to rest and begins to moan amazing groans that sound like a person dying, but even worse. PQ observes, so terrifying to the ear of human mortals that it astonishes the very clergy themselves who have been to listen. Those who hear the sounds are left immobilized and they require, require proper cordials to revive their sinking spirits and confounded imaginations. PK's, PQ's wonder in this pamphlet is the wonder that animates science. The Hampshire wonder frames the account of the tree with facticity and with elite scientific masculinity. From his opening statements, PQ claims expertise in natural philosophy and foregrounds the matter of, vera of veracity. He insists that this phenomenon can be well attested by several men of great learning who have both seen and heard it. And then after rehearsing various explanations, he attributes all these other explanations to other people. Some people say it's a ghost, other people think it's a mandrake, still others think it's hell coming, <laughs> coming, um, coming up. But he presents his findings as a virtuoso to clear up certain matters of fact relating to the time and manner of its groaning. He confirms that the tree is not hollow, and he turns to the findings from George Cheney's 1740, an essay on regimen, to explain that the tree's ductile organs and in elementary tubes produce elastic vibrations, which seem like groaning. So for the groaning part of this, PK, PQ provides a scientific explanation, and as a consequence, wonder about the moaning dissipates. But what he doesn't explain and what he does not discount is that the tree took a two-day walk. That wonder persists. As we can see in the example of the walking, wailing tree, the presence of natural philosophical explanations may not fully eradicate wonder. One John Whaley evokes his status as a professor of physics when he presents readers with evidence of a bleeding moon in the Dublin sky of 1712. And in that text, he explains the phenomenon as an optical illusion. We still, the, the name persists, we still know this as a mock moon. But he also, just like in the ambling tree, reserves space for the bleeding moon to be a portent, that is, a sign of the supernatural. Three, 18th century science and the imagination. In this final section, I'm gonna to return to Boyle and I wanna say a few words about Robert Hooke. 
I return to Boyle because he not only cultivates the experience of wonder in the practice of natural philosophy, but also because it worries him. He cautions against it. And it is this latter point, the dangers of wonder, that I want to bring into view. In Boyle's caution, we see that wonder contains the potential to disrupt social hierarchies and in the process challenge us to consider whose interpretation and whose truth matters. So Boyle's concern does not evoke Francis Bacon's earlier worry that wonder leads to what Bacon calls broken knowledge. For Francis Bacon, wonder is, he calls it a tedious curiosity and basically imagines wonder as kind of occupying a mind until you're just broken off and musing and it has nothing to do with empirical inquiry. But Boyle isn't particularly worried about wonder as being too alluring in and of itself either. Boyle's concern is really expressed through a policing of the boundary between scientific knowledge and theological knowledge. And for Boyle, that boundary between the two is really a hierarchy. So the context for Boyle's scientific work, indeed for all scientific work in the 17th and 18th centuries, is this intellectual and religious framework of physico-theology. So in this understanding, natural philosophy thrives as a study of second causes, not first. As Charlotte Lennox explains, careful observation of the natural world leads to a profound and humble appreciation of the divine. She writes, in the minutest animals, we perceive the care and wisdom of an infinite power exerted for their formation and protection. Perceptions possible because of natural philosophy, but conclusions that reflect the glory of God. In Lennox's exaltation, what an awe and adoration ought it, it to turn our thoughts towards the great creator of them all. John Dennis, reflecting upon astronomy, finds that the more admirable ideas and a more admirable spirit show the attributes of the creator. And even studying worms, those debased little creatures, Joseph Brown assures his dedicatee, and by extension, us, that studying worms culminates in the admiration of the creator. Natural philosophical examination for these thinkers generates wonder, but it must always use wonder to promote the humility of faith. Yet as Boyle elaborates, wonder threatens to, in his words, inflate the value of creatures of a nature very much inferior to ours. To avoid what he views as an inversion of the natural order of humans above animals, Boyle pivots to the hierarchy of human and divine to reimagine what wonder could be. Contemplating, discussing, even aspiring to know God demands wonder. And yet this wonder for and about the divine must be accompanied by veneration. And that's a key word for Boyle. The divine cause or author of them deserves our highest wonder and veneration. Veneration, like wonder, is a feeling and an action. It is a feeling of deep respect and reverence towards some person or thing, and it is an action of showing that reverence. Veneration puts the in individual into an inferior relation to something else. Wonder and veneration privileges rank and hierarchy and demands human submission and inferiority to the divine. Now, within the context of physico-theology, Boyle's claim coheres, it's coherent, and there's an internal logic. But it likewise promotes, and this is my point, it promotes a very particular version of wonder. The study of the natural world requires wonder that cannot be separated from human veneration for the divine. The collective focus of natural philosophers ought to be on those notices that are apt to increase their knowledge of God and consequently their veneration for him. So notice the causal. The boundless ocean, for example, 
which has myriad objects for study, is a metonym for the boundlessness of God. This, to aspire a farther knowledge of God that we may better adore him, is man's duty and his happiness. Imagining the divine through natural philosophical language, but not with the instrumentalism that Boyle identifies with elsewhere. He calls them sooty empirics. It's not a compliment. Boyle writes that God is an object whose nature is so very singular and whose perfections are so immense that no assiduity of considering him can make him cease to be admirable. The inextricability of wonder and veneration in Boyle's imagination, together with his insistence upon their boundedness, point, I want to say, to the ethical implications of wonder. When scientific practice circuits wonder into veneration, it places the practitioner in a position of humility in the vastness of God's presence. And just as this logic informs that practice of science, so too it informs the justification for scientific instruments. Boyle's air pump on the left, Hooke's microscope on the right, these were the showpieces of the early royal society brought out for demonstrations when visitors arrived. Boyle's air pump introduced technology to visualize combustion and respiration. It enabled the study of airs, and that's what Wright is imagining a hundred years later. The reader, the observer, can't see air. We can't see it. It's invisible to our eyes, except as an effect on others. We see it when leaves flutter. We see it when feathers lilt but air remains stubbornly transparent and as such unknowable, except when captured and manipulated in the air pump. Thus, Wright's white cockatoo hovers between life and death, between breathing and suffocating. Various writers imagine that the use of scientific instruments enables one to experience natural philosophical wonder. In a poem called Philosophy, addressed to the young ladies who attended Mr. Booth's lectures in Dublin, Henry Jones poetically imagines scientific demonstrations and in the process archives the demonstrations natural philosophers throughout the century performed in a variety of spaces, including coffee houses, shops, the Royal Society, and homes. Jones devotes his poem to the experience of witnessing a public demonstration given by a Scottish itinerant lecturer, John Booth. The poet commands the young ladies of the title to visualize Booth exhibiting various scientific instruments, including a prism and a magnet. Behold, ye fair, how radiant colors grow. Lo, here, the magnets, ma excuse me, magnets' magic charms the sight and fills the soul with wonder and delight. Jones turns to the first person to draw upon the lexicon of wonder as simultaneously physiological, as epistemological, and as effective. What pleasing fervors in my bosom rise, reflects the poet, adding, what fixed attention, what deep surprise scientific instrumentation produces. And the poem concludes with a call to study nature, following those precepts of physico-theology. Behold the book of nature, enjoins the poet, whose opening expand, fill with the wonders of her maker's hand. In these writers, we see that if wonder persists, that is, if wonder does not evaporate or dissipate, it must always be directed into veneration of the divine. So wonder facilitates a projection of a social structure that is supported by and in the service of a particular religious political set of beliefs, physico-theology. But while Boyle's version of wonder insists upon veneration in this kind of hierarchy, there were others who imagined that wonder could produce 
different forms of social structures that were not physical theology, but instead other kinds of visions of hierarchy. Another scientific instrument, which had a long afterlife, the magic lantern, reveals in very specific terms how the experience of wonder could be manufactured and cultivated to advance hierarchy and power. And I'll conclude my talk today with some brief comments about how the magic lantern discloses another aspect of the ethics of wonder. A descendant of the camera obscura, the magic lantern is a concave mirror positioned behind a candle with a lens in front that projects images on a wall. Much of the instrument's history is a history of producing the experience of wonder, particularly in the 19th century. But early designers sketched slides for the magic lantern that were astounding. In 10 figures, death, Huygens portrays a skeleton in motion. It walks, it removes a head, it tosses a skull in the, in the air. At 1720, volume translated um, of a Dutch mathematician has an engraving of the magic lantern projecting the image of a minotaur. Champions of the magic lantern were also keen to imagine its, its pedagogical potential. I mean, arguably, this is a magic lantern, right? Um, uh, Leibniz um, predicted that the magic lantern could be used to teach les lessons on perspective and motion. Johann Zahn suggested projections for anatomical lessons. And Ehrenberger made slides for the magic lantern to accompany lectures on natural history, geography, and mathematics. And Tita Chico made a PowerPoint slide, right? So we're still in this kind of technology. Robert Hooke's version of the magic lantern, which he discusses in Philosophical Transactions from 1668, points us to a social and intellectual hierarchy in sharp contrast to that that Boyle imagines. Like his contemporaries, Hook was keen to foreground the wonder one experiences when viewing images from the magic lantern. These are effects not only very delightful, but also very wonderful. That effective experience comes to encompass an ever-widening range of emotions. All those passions of love, fear, reverence, honor, and astonishment. Who can experience this effective journey is important in Hooke's formulation. He explicitly argues that this process is available only to an uninitiated spectator. That is, individuals who do not know the contrivance, individuals who are not well-versed in optics. These are neither the foolish nor the wise. It's the rest of us. As Isaac Watts explains, those most primed the effects of wonder are persons of a middling rank of genius or improvement. Hook explicitly links the production of wonder to the magic lantern's potential as an instrument of duplicity rather than of education and insight. Had the heathen priests of old been acquainted with it, he writes, their oracles and temples would have been much more famous for the miracles of their imaginary deities. Hook goes on to imagine gods, devils, humans, and animals appearing as apparitions and vanishing in a cloud. But he provides a counterfactual, subjunctive history, had heathens, that envisages an optical instrument as a tool for trickery, and I've selected this in part for the date because he's writing at the same time about how the microscope shows you what's really there, even though lots of people were very skeptical. So this is, it. on the one hand, Hooke is defending scientific instrumentation as not creating something that isn't there. But on the other, here, he's foregrounding how it can manipulate what a viewer sees. The wonder that Hook imagines in this moment leaves a viewer powerless and manipulated, duped into believing these projections as real. In Hook's imagination, the magic lantern is an instrument that creates two viewers, those who know its secret and those who do not. And Hook spends a long time explaining how one must hide the means how such apparitions are made so that they shall not be discoverable. That 
practitioner must keep the apparatus from view that it may not be perceived by the company in the room. Only then may the whole operation be easily performed. Hook reveals that the purpose of the magic lantern, its whole operation, is to create those two audiences. The magic lantern is an instrument of secret knowledge, available to some, but hidden to most. This is, in other words, scientific instrumentation designed to produce and cultivate wonder for a collective that is imagined as distinct from a smaller group with a greater power. For the majority, that is, for those who know little or nothing about optics, refraction, or reflection, their wonder is the wonder of not knowing. It's not the not knowing that begins scientific inquiry, nor does it culminate in veneration to the divine. Instead, the magic lantern reveals the construction of a middling sort, instituted through its exclusion from and subordination to an elite minority. The story of the magic lantern reveals that the potential to cultivate wonder in others is simultaneously and inextricably the potential to exert mastery over others, whether that mastery be political, intellectual, or ideological. And the story of wonder? The story of wonder tells us that when we study the natural world around us, when we bring scientific instruments to our aid as we do so, we are simultaneously imagining what we value is true as well as our own social relations with one another. The story of wonder also tells us how to imagine new reparative relations. But that, my friends, is a story for another day. Thank you very much.